we go across the vast oceans and into the desert worlds of the African continent to visit a great country that is not only amazing for its history, but has a culture that strives under the beating sun of life and continues with great positive energy. Welcome to the lovely, beautiful, and historic country of Egypt. So this great country known as Egypt, let's get into the basics. It has a population of 97,290,300 people, which makes it rank with that lucky number 13th in the world when it comes to population. Now, keep in mind, this is just a 2018 estimate because back in 2017, their census stated that the country had 94 million people, which is pretty crazy because I guess that means they had 3 million people born in the country this year. Maybe, maybe more people moved, I don't know. But as for all these people, they live in an area of approximately a land size of 1.01 million kilometers square, making Egypt a pretty big country. As a matter of fact, it ranks 29th in the world when it comes to land size. And with that land size and its population, it ranks 118th when it comes to population density, having 96 people per kilometer square. Now, okay, here on the channel, normally we talk about really, really positive things about the countries. And for this video, I mean, I don't really want to start off on a negative one, but this is just a fact that kind of came out right away. And the reason I got to talk about it is because when I talk about land size, I usually talk about water percentage. Because as for Egypt, it has a water percentage of 0.632%. And that's pretty crazy that it has such a low percentage of water and water is a big issue within this country. As a matter of fact, it's not just access to water, but over half of the population doesn't have access to clean sanitary water, which is a big problem in Egypt. And unfortunately, because of that, they say approximately 50,000 children die a year because of diarrhea. So yeah, just, you know, I know it's a bad thing to start with, but because I was talking about water percentage, I just want to get that bad one out there, okay? Let's move on. Let's talk about some good things about the country. Now, one thing is when it comes to all this water, most of it actually comes from the Nile River. And it should be known that the Nile River is considered the second largest river in the entire world, coming in at a total length of 6,853 kilometers long. Now, of course, there's been a lot of arguments between whether or not the Nile is longer or whether or not the Amazon River is longer, but they're actually pretty close to each other. And although for some they may believe the Amazon River is longer, the Nile River is actually one of the most important rivers in all of human history. The reason for this is because most Egyptian cities in not just the modern world, but also during the ancient Egyptian times, are currently or were constructed along the riverbed within Egypt, and thus in history it helped us create civilization, which has been built up to the modern world we know today. And with that in mind, let's take a look at the GDP. Now, for these videos, we like to use the purchasing power parity because it's a great way to compare nations. Now, for Egypt's GDP purchasing power parity, it sits at approximately $1.201 trillion. Now, that's just a 2017 estimate, but it currently ranks 21st in the world when it comes to GDP. So that's pretty good. As for the GDP per capita, though, this is where it becomes a little bit of a problem, as the per capita lists Egypt having approximately $12,671 per person, making it sit at about a hundredth in the world, and that's something that they're greatly trying to improve. And to go further into this GDP, we need to look at the exports of the country. For example, the exports of Egypt sit at approximately $27.7 billion, ranking 59th in the world. Now, the biggest thing that Egypt exports is obviously crude petroleum, which sits at approximately 14%. But let's not forget good old-fashioned Egyptian gold, which makes up 10% of all the exports within the country. And those two are just like the obvious exports that people think of when you think of Egypt. Because for some people in the world, they may not think that agriculture is actually a big thing, partially because they've probably seen a lot of movies of Egypt and they think, well, it's maybe just a big, you know, dry desert sort of country. And although they say that the desert makes up about 90% of all of Egypt, they are actually the largest producers and cultivators for dates out of any country in the world. And as for figs, they stand at second in the world. However, they also sit at fourth in the world for strawberries, onions, buffalo milk, and eggplants. And actually, when it comes to your tomatoes and watermelons, a lot of people actually get these from Egypt because, well, they sit at fifth in the world. 
And for its agriculture, it actually makes up over 29% of the workforce. And oddly enough, out of all the Arab countries, Egypt is one country that isn't dependent on as much oil as the others. As a matter of fact, in 2018, it had the largest GDP that was non-oil based out of all the Arab countries. So there you go guys, as much as you may think it's just oil coming from Egypt and that they have no agriculture, eh, we're a little bit wrong on that one. Now let's quickly jump over to imports because they sit at approximately $68.2 billion, ranking 42nd in the world. Now the largest thing that they import is refined petroleum and petrol gas, with a total of 9.9% .9 of its imports. But also, Egypt is a huge importer of wheat, which makes up about 4% of its imports. As a matter of fact, Egypt has such strong relations with the United States when it comes to wheat, that they are the largest wheat market for the United States, coming in at a total of $1 billion, which has the United States supplying up to 46% of all of Egypt's wheat needs. Now for this economy, it is all under supervision from a unitary semi-presidential government, which means they actually have a president and a prime minister. I did not know that. With the current president of the country being Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the prime minister being Mustafa Madbouli. And of course, at the height of this all, the capital of the entire country is, you probably guessed it, Cairo. Now, Cairo itself is one of the largest cities in not only Egypt, but the African continent, and it's considered the 15th largest city in the entire world. Now, modern Cairo was founded in 969 AD by the Fatimid dynasty. But however, the ground of which the new city stands was at one point major spots of ancient Egyptian culture. For example, Old Cairo predates the Fatimid dynasty, and because of its great history, it's not only one of the world's oldest Arabic cities, but it's also been designated a World Heritage Site since 1979. So of course, when we talk about heritage and Egypt, we gotta mention the fact that it has a lot of it, like a lot of heritage. As during the height of the ancient world, it was a pinnacle for multiple accomplishments for humanity. And what I mean by that, for example, is they are still trying to figure out how they actually built the pyramids. I mean, they have really a kind of good guesses, but truthfully, some scientists are going, we still don't really know. But one thing that's very interesting about its history is their artifacts. And for example, let's take the oldest piece of clothing that was worn by a human being, which was found in Egypt. Now this was more or less a dress than any random piece of clothing that is known as the Tarkon dress. And it was discovered in 913 AD and is approximately over 5,000 years old and is currently at the University College of London. Now Egypt is a very, very big and defined country, but if you go down to the southern area of the border, you'll notice that its border is dotted instead of straight. Straight. And this particular dotted region on the border is very well known, known as Bur Tawil, and it is a section between Egypt and Sudan that has not been claimed by either countries. Being 2,060 kilometers square, it is different from the Triangle Territory to the right, known as the Halaib Triangle, which has a land size of approximately 20,580 kilometers square. Now, as for the Halaib Triangle, it is one area that is actually disputed between these two countries, as it was an administrative boundary set by the British in 1902. And currently for this region, Egypt asserts its political boundary, while Sudan has administrative boundary. So basically, there's a lot of confusion of who kind of owns this area going back and forth between the two countries. But as for Berto Wheel off to the left, it is the only region on earth that is considered habitable that is not claimed by any known government. Now one thing that we all know about the history of Egypt is that they were really great builders and artists, but one thing that is not really talked about when it comes to the history of Egypt is how the Egyptians created what is considered the first real synthetic pigment. Now it is known as Egyptian blue and it is seen in many drawings on the walls and hieroglyphics. And for this particular type of pigment, it was used for thousands of years. It is also known as calcium copper silicate and although more popularly known as Egyptian blue, especially by the English since its term was coined in 1809, some people also call it cerulean. And lastly, guys, this is the fact that I was telling you about earlier, the one that totally blew me away, the one that I think you guys might get blown away by, and that is that the Statue of Liberty in America was not originally going to go to America, but was actually gonna go 
to Egypt. That is right, the original sketches for the Statue of Liberty didn't have her designed as a Roman woman, but as a Muslim woman in a veil. This is because the original sculptor, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, originally intended to have the Statue of Liberty be a beacon that was guarding the newly designed Suez Canal, which opened in 1869. And at that time, it was going to be known as Egypt carving the light to Asia. However, unfortunately, Egypt actually rejected this plan outright, and instead he decided to pitch it towards the Americans and change the Muslim look of what is now known as the Statue of Liberty to a Roman looking woman. We are exploring the world of ancient Egypt and looking at some of the biggest discoveries made in modern time, starting with discovery number 10 the discovery of King Tut's tomb. This tomb was unearthed in 1922 by a team that was led by Howard Carter, and the tomb was filled with a lot of different treasures, including King Tut, or as he was known as King Tutankhamun's death mask, which today is very, very, very iconic. Google his name, and that's the first thing you see. Now, King Tut was known as a boy king, but he ended up dying in his teens. And the analysis that they did of his remains, it suggests that he actually suffered from a variety of different health problems and he used to actually walk around with a cane. He spent a lot of his time ruling Egypt between the years 1332 BC and 1323 BC, trying to really restore Egypt's traditional polytheistic religion. And this was something actually that was interrupted by his father, Akhenaten, who started to promote the supremacy of the Aten, which is the sun disk. And that religion, by the way, is actually known as Atenism. Next up, we have the Rosetta Stone. Very, very, very popular. This dates back to 196 BC. And this Rosetta Stone, it contains a decree that was written by a group of priests that mentions the right of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, who was 13 years old at the time, to rule Egypt. So the decree was written in three different languages. We have hieroglyph, then there is Demotic and Greek. Now, when the stone was discovered in the year 1799, only the Greek language was known, but because the Greek text it had the exact same decree as the other two languages, it really helped scientists and researchers to decipher those languages and what they had to say. And since nobody speaks those languages anymore, having the Greek language was really, really, really good in the interpretation of a language like hieroglyphic. Oxyrhynchus papyri comes in at number eight. Yeah, kind of a weird word. But between the years 1896 and 1907, archaeologists Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt discovered over 500,000 papyri fragments that date back around 1800 years. So this investigation, it found many different fragments in the ruins of Oxyrhynchus, which was a large ancient town in southern Egypt that really began to flourish at the time when the Roman Empire actually controlled Egypt. Now, because of the condition in the town, the papyri used by the residents were able to survive nearly two millennia. The papyri included Christian gospels as well as magic spells and also a wrestling match contract. As a matter of fact, one of these spells that was written on the papyri was meant to invoke the gods to burn the heart of a woman until she fell in love with the person that casted the spell. This, by the way, was according to Franco Maltomini of the University of of Udin in Italy. Next up at number seven, we have the Khufu ship. This ship is a discovery of ancient Egypt and it was discovered by an Egyptian archaeologist named Kamal al Malak in the year 1954. Now this was hidden with other grave goods, as they were called. Egyptians had collected these things and they were used for the afterlife. Now this boat vessel was reconstructed using cedar wood from Lebanon and is currently on display in the Geezer Solar Boat Museum. Now the Khufu ship is one of the oldest, largest and best preserved vessels from ancient times. The measurements of this, well, it measures 43.6 meters, which is 143 feet long, and 5.9 meters or 19.5 feet wide. Pretty big boat. Continuing to number six, we have the tomb KV 
1995. In 1995, excavations at KV5 revealed that the little study tomb was actually the largest ever constructed in the Valley of the Kings. So as excavation continued, reports suggested that archaeologists had found 121 corridors and chambers in the tomb. And the researchers said that they think more than 150 will eventually be found. Archaeologists found that the tomb was used to bury the sons of Pharaoh, Ramses II, who we'll talk about later on in this episode, as a matter of fact. And at least six royal sons are known to be placed in KV-5. Continuing now to number five, this discovery is the Bastet Temple. Now this 2,200 year old temple is believed to have been dedicated to an ancient Egyptian cat goddess named Bastet. And this was discovered in Alexandria, Egypt. Mohammed Abdel Maksud, which is the Egyptian archaeologist who led the excavation team, he said that this discovery may be the first trace of the long sought location of Alexandria's royal quarter. And because of the large number of statues depicting Bastet that were found in the ruins, he said that it suggests that this this may be the first Ptolemaic era temple dedicated to the cat goddess to be discovered in Alexandria. So yep, there could be several more. Now this would indicate that the worship of an ancient Egyptian deity actually continued during the later years when the Greek had a lot of influence in Egypt during the Ptolemaic period. Next up at number four, we have the Valley of the Golden Mummies. This is a very interesting one. So after intensive excavations were going down, Egyptian archaeologists, they released some details of what is described as one of the most spectacular discoveries in Egypt in recent decades. Never before have such a number of mummies been found in a single site in Egypt. And those were the words by Dr. Zahi Hawass, who is the director of the Baharia Excavations, and he said this in an interview. Now, in some of the tombs that were explored, archaeologists, they counted over a hundred mummies of men, children and women they say that entire families actually appeared together and some of the bodies were wrapped in plain linen but others were decorated with masks and painted scenes of cartonage which is made of linen and papyrus that served as a mummy case but they said that no two mummy decorations were the exact same and i guess there's no indication as to why some of them were covered in just plain linen while others had decorated designs on them number three leads us to the silver king in the year 1939 archaeologist pierre montet he discovered the tomb of susanese the first who was a pharaoh who ruled Egypt around 3,000 years ago. And his burial chamber was located in Tanis, which is a city on the Nile Delta. This particular pharaoh was buried in a coffin that was made of silver, and he was wearing a golden burial mask. Now, Susanese I is sometimes called the Silver King because of his silver coffin. Susanese I, he was a chief priest of the sun god Amun-Ra at Tanis, and his family lineage can be traced back to the great pharaoh Ramses the first. And by the way, Susanese, if you're wondering, that name there, it means the star appearing in the city. Getting down to the last two discoveries. Coming in at number two, we have the Pyramid Town at Giza. Since the year 1988, there's a team of archaeologists from the AERA, or the Ancient Egyptian Research Associates, and they've been excavating a town near the Pyramid of Mankara on the Giza Plateau. And this pyramid for the Pharaoh Mankara, who reigned from roughly the years 2490 BC to 2472 BC it was the last of the pyramids constructed at Giza. And the people who lived at Giza would have actually been involved, heavily involved, in building this pyramid. The discoveries made at this town include barracks for soldiers, as well as a giant house for senior officials. And also, a discovery was made of a port that was used to import goods. These discoveries provide a lot of information about the people who built the pyramids, as well as the logistics and the thought process behind pyramid construction. Even details of what the people were fed during the construction of the pyramid. So a whole lot of information came out of this. And as you can imagine, a whole new world of discovery and research opened up. And the final discovery I'm gonna share in this episode is the discovery of Ramses II. 
He was the third king of the 19th dynasty that reigned between the years 1292 and 1190 BC of the ancient Egyptians who reigned from 1279 to 13 BC. And that, by the way, was the second longest ruling dynasty in Egyptian history. Ramses II was known for his extensive building programs and initiatives and for many of the massive statues of him that were found all over Egypt. He's probably one of the most widely known pharaohs, even to people who aren't even interested in learning about ancient Egypt. Either way though, the tomb is not the longest tomb of any of the kings that were found in the Valley of the Kings, but it's probably the largest when it comes to area. It covers more than 820 square meters, which is 8,800 square feet. And by the way, one thing to mention was that uh, papyrus actually indicated that there was a robbery of Ramesses' tomb. And this dates back to the 28th year of the reign of Ramesses III. Now, the mummy of Ramesses II was not found in its tomb, though. It was first removed to the tomb of his father's KV-17 during ancient times, and then it was moved to Deir el-Bahari, where it was discovered in the year 1881. Pretty magnificent that the pharaoh wasn't even found in the tomb. Either way though, the identity of the pharaoh in the story of Moses and the Exodus recorded in the Bible and the Quran has been a subject of a lot of debate, but many scholars do accept that it was King Ramses II who ruled at that time. And that's what makes this discovery so surprising and amazing. Egypt, from ancient times to present day, plays an important role in our world. And just like every other country, Egypt has misconceptions that have circulated around the world. Starting at number 10, Egypt is in the Middle East. So most people forget that Egypt is part of the continent of Africa. Egypt is both North African as well as Middle Eastern if you want to get technical. And it's actually a Mediterranean Middle Eastern transcontinental country located in North Africa and West Asia if you want to get even more technical. However, when you ask Egyptians, they consider themselves simply Egyptian. For Egyptians, African is just a geographical term, same as Asian and Middle Eastern. Practically all West Asian and Middle Eastern people, they don't even see any reason either why they should or would identify with the whole Asian continent. Either way though, Egypt, yes, is predominantly in Africa. A lot of people simply don't know that or just completely forget. Number nine, Egyptians live in the desert. Although more than 90% of Egypt's land is desert, they actually live in the remaining 10%. In addition to lots of desert reclamation works that have been undertaken over the years, making it possible for people to live there. Therefore, there's actually vibrant cities and they have buildings as well as proper infrastructure. They definitely also don't live in tents. Don't say that to an Egyptian, that's very offensive. Do you live in tents? Number eight, Egyptians ride camels for transportation. This is also a big lie. Egyptians do not ride camels to work. They drive cars or they ride motorcycles or they use public transit. So you won't see any camels around the city nor are you able to book a camel ride for your daily commute to work. They don't have camel parking lots either. As a matter of fact, many Egyptians, they haven't even seen a camel in real life anyways, let alone know how to ride a camel. So that's just a big fat lie that's completely not true. The lie number seven is all Egyptians are Muslims. Did you know that Christianity existed and was already well established in Egypt long before the Muslim conquest? And as a matter of fact, it's still a prominent religion in Egypt today. Islam, however, now is a dominant religion in Egypt with an estimated 90% of the population following the religion. Also, almost all of Egyptian Muslims are Sunnis and Islam has been recognized as a state religion since 19. 80. But yes, there are millions of residents that still practice other religions. Pyramids are far, far away. So this lie is kind of perpetuated by the iconic images of pyramids with a backdrop of endless desert. It's sort of like an illusion. It's kind of really spread all around the world, this image of Egypt. But in reality, the pyramids don't actually look exactly the same as in photos, and the desert around them is not as vast. As well as there's buses that drive around these pyramids like they're 
riding on a highway. Let's take a closer look at the Giza Pyramid Complex. Now this lies on the west bank of the Nile and it's literally a stone's throw from the packed and busy city life. If you look at this image, you'll see all the buildings and shops like they're very close to the Giza Pyramid Complex. So contrary to popular belief, these pyramids are not in some far distant land in the corners of Egypt. They're literally right in the middle of cities. Continue with number five, Egyptians speak their own language. Okay, the predominant dialect in Egypt is Egyptian Colloquial Arabic or Masri Egyptian. Literary Arabic is the official language and the most widely written. It's also the liturgical language of Islam, which of course is the majority religion. There's also modern standard Arabic or Al Fusha, which means clear Arabic. And that developed out of classical or medieval Arabic. And this is learned only in schools and is is the common language of the educated persons throughout the Arab world. Now it's taught in most Arab countries and that's why they can understand each other even if they have different dialects. There's a huge percentage of Egyptians also that speak English and a good number of them speak French as well as German as well as others speak Italian and even Russian. So yeah, if you travel to Egypt, you'll be 100% fine. You won't get lost in some sort of ancient coded language or anything like that. I know a lot of mystery and cryptic symbols and everything are associated with Egypt. But yeah, when it comes to their language, you're not gonna have to sit there and try to crack the code of what the Egyptians are talking about. Moving on to lie number four, Egyptians are not friendly to tourists. And yeah, this one is just not true. Egyptians are one of the most hospitable and generous people in the entire world. And some would even say that their generosity and hospitality gets really uncomfortable because they literally wouldn't even take no for an answer. They'll hold you down, hold your mouth open, and feed you. That's how generous they are. No guys, well of course I'm exaggerating, but you kind of get the point. They're extremely friendly people, they're helpful as well, and they would never make you feel lonely or out of place. So don't be surprised if you go and visit Egypt if you're interrupted by a person, a stranger even, that's just gonna give you feedback about anything, even if that thing has nothing to do with them. They just wanna help you out somehow or fill you in on information that you may not know. Number three, now this one, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna make you laugh. Everyone walks like an Egyptian. Okay, this this is the first time I've seen this, all right? So check this out, guys. Walk Like an Egyptian is a song that was recorded by the American band, The Bangles, and it was released back in the year 1986. Now, it's largely responsible for this misconception and also images of ancient hieroglyphs like this one on your screen are sort of responsible for people thinking that Egyptians actually walk and move around like this. Now, the person who wrote this song, his name is Liam Sternberg and he said that he got the idea when he was on a ferry boat and saw people struggling to keep their balance and he said that the way they held out their arms and jerked around made it look like they were doing some kind of Egyptian movement and that if the boat actually suddenly moved they would completely fall over but despite what the song or even some movies portray people in Egypt they walk and dance like normal human beings. The only people who actually walk like an Egyptian are just the tourists that don't know any better. And, oh God. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Really, people thought Egyptians walk like that? Moving on to number two. Speaking of dancing and moving around, this next lie is Egyptian women belly dance. Many people think that it's simply a rite of passage for women. Oh, you're an Egyptian woman. All right, do some belly dancing for me. But when you speak to Egyptian women, a lot of them just have a very hard time even twisting their belly from one place to another. It's just not something that everybody knows. Although belly dancing is deemed as a form of art by some people, it's also something that is very frowned upon by many people in Egypt. So you won't really see women everywhere belly dancing or even revealing their stomachs for that matter. And the final lie we're gonna look at in this episode is all women don't have 
right. So this last point is a little bit controversial, so let me break it down for you. Egypt is seen by many as a divided society and is identified as an elite versus street society. The people who are viewed as elite are Western educated, they're very literate in English, and they hold high status jobs in large corporations, in the military, as well as in the government and different parts of society. Now the elite versus street divide has consequences for female life opportunities as well. Elite families believe in gender equality and that pretty much means that they're seen as equal with men and they should be treated equally as well. Now the elite women are able to vote, they're able to work in transnational corporations as well as teach in universities and participate as citizen activists. Now on the other hand there are those of the street and some men of the street class they treat women as property without rights and women of the street class are not allowed to vote or hold high positions in leadership or work to make their own money. Most street class women labor long hours at family owned basic needs establishments, but this is considered service to the family and not necessarily considered work. So yes, like in every society, you're gonna find women being treated unequally and unfairly, but this is not the majority of women in Egypt. Starting with lie number 10, sandstorms and extreme heat all the time. See, this is one of the biggest misconceptions about Egypt, is that it's just a big desert and therefore there's all sandstorms happening all the time and really, really, really hot weather all day, every day. Well, the capital of Egypt, it has a hot desert climate. However, instead of being such a very dry land, it being so close to the Nile Delta, it makes it a city that is very humid, actually. Temperatures are usually between 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, and winters are pretty mild, although temperatures can fall below 10 degrees Celsius at nighttime. So it's not all scorching heat all year round. For number nine, no arts and entertainment scene. A lot of Westerners actually tend to form the idea that Egypt isn't really involved in arts and entertainment. But the reality is that in the Middle East and the Arab world, Egypt has played a huge role in the arts and entertainment industry, including film and theater, television, music production. Back in the 1950s, actually, Egyptian cinema industry, it was the world's third largest. Since 1976, Cairo has held the annual Cairo International Film Festival, which has been accredited by the International Federation of Film Producers Association. Another misconception about Egypt coming at number eight is that Egyptians all live in tents. Outside of the main cities, Egyptians live in small communities and different clusters around oases, as well as different roads and transport routes, including the Nile River. Also, you'll find villages that have houses built of mud and goat skin. You'll find those in the Nile Delta. But in the main cities, Egyptians do not live in tents at all, nor are they always out camping. They actually have buildings and houses and streets like so many other countries in the world. So you can toss that imagination out of your mind because that's not the case in Egypt. Not everybody's in a tent. Okay, so the light number seven has to do with swimming in the Nile River. Egyptians, they definitely don't do that. It's actually very dangerous. Some parts of the Nile are impossible to swim where the current is very, very strong. And other areas, you're gonna find a lot of solid natural rock there that make it impossible to swim without getting seriously damaged. On top of the risk of running into a crocodile, in the Nile and the fact that there's so much waste and dead animals thrown into the river. So for all these different factors listed, you'll see why swimming in the Nile isn't the best idea at all. With that said though, the Nile River is a landmark of Egypt and definitely something that foreigners are fascinated to actually see with their own two eyes. For number six, Egypt is ancient Egypt. Okay, so there's no denying that ancient Egypt definitely left its mark on the planet and left behind some fascinating places even to explore, like the pyramids and things like that. But besides these historical places to see, you can actually go hiking to the summit of 
Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's Monastery, among other things, like going scuba diving in the Red Sea, as well as other activities that will definitely fill up your time if you go and visit Egypt. Light number five, Egyptians wear jalabiyas to work. You know, it's almost impossible to really identify Egypt's traditional dress code because each part of the country has their own traditions and dialects and various styles of dressing. Even jalabiyas worn in villages, they're actually not even close in similarity to those that are worn by the Bedouins or the upper Egyptians, for instance. Here's a big one, Khan El Khalil Khalili is for shopping. Khan El Khalili is actually more of a tourist market that Egyptians hardly ever even visit themselves. In fact, Egyptians have malls and department stores just like most other countries. Mall of Arabia is the biggest mall in Egypt that covers more than 22,000 square kilometers. Now, for number three, here's one that I was more recently introduced to. There is Ta'amea, also known as falafel. Then you have Mechalel, which is pickled eggplants, or even masa'a, which is eggplants cooked in an authentic Egyptian way. And the diet also includes koshari, which is mixed of rice and pasta and chickpeas and lentils and onions, tomato and garlic sauce, mm, delicious. And then of course, I can't forget molohea, which is something that you definitely have to try. It's one of those foods that you have to taste yourself because it's gonna be so hard for you to understand it if someone's trying to explain it. Trust me, I've tried it before on several occasions. It's really good. The lie number two, Egyptians know Farsi, AKA Persian. Although Arabic and Farsi are both written from right to left, Arabic and Farsi, they're totally different languages. This is a common Western misconception of the languages, by the way. Now, you do find some overlapping sounds in both of these languages, but the similarity between Farsi and Arabic is kind of like similarities between English and French. You see, they're totally completely different languages, but certain similarities can be found. Now, we end this episode off at number one. Egyptians aren't funny. This one is just not right. <laughs> Personal experience, Egyptians are some of the funniest people I know. And either way, Egyptians are infamous for their sense of humor. Maybe it's honestly from something in the Nile River. I don't know, it's probably in their gene pool. But either way, this is a fact that has been proven countless times. Egyptians, they resort to sarcasm and humor to express their own viewpoint or also to avoid any problems. When Egyptians tell a joke, Oftentimes, their purpose isn't really to make you laugh, more so it's to make themselves laugh. So I've been told anyways. <laughs>